Most of my research is on artificial intelligence, different aspects of artificial intelligence, and usually I try to find applications of the different strands of artificial intelligence into teaching and learning. Or in other words, uh, most of my research is about finding ways in which we can use technology, and in particular artificial intelligence, to help people learn better and to help people teach other people better. Some of the research we have done in the in recent years is about creating tools to help to help lecturers in the lab to know what their students are doing, whether they are engaged or not with the material, whether they are learning, whether they are making progress. Because one of the difficulties that you have, and this is something I face in my own lectures, is well, you're there, you're talking to your students, or maybe you're interacting with them, you're doing exercises. They it looks like they are making progress, but because our minds are limited. Uh, you ha we have a tendency as human beings to focus on the brightest students and we don't realize that some people are lagging behind be because they also try not to mm, call your attention that much so that you don't realize that they are lagging behind. Uh, and our tools, because they are able to monitor the state of the, of the classroom for everyone, not just the people that you are humanly um, pushed to, to look at, so to say. Um, it makes you more aware of the real situation. So you may think that, oh, well, the, the class is doing great. The, I, I have the impression that everyone is learning a lot. And then you look at the exam and you realize that a lot of people have failed. And you say, why? What, what did they do wrong? Well, part of what we are doing in, in, in the research in my group is creating tools to make you more aware of the real situation. Is everybody making progress or is only some students? Are they making progress throughout the whole material or just some aspects and there are other aspects that are more difficult and they are not really understanding and you should make additional effort on that? There are a lot of people working on using technology and in particular artificial intelligence to help people collaborate better, to learn together better uh, by using technology. And there's also an emerging trend now, and this is what we are doing in our group, to help st uh, people learn better uh, by giving them a bit more control over the learning process, what we, which is what we call exploratory learning. And some people, there's a, a buzzword now in the field that many people are repeating over the place, which is learning with games and doing serious games for learning, which is basically the same thing. The idea is changing the paradigm from what we have had for the last 150 years in the 19th century, when you went to school, when I went to school, there was someone in the, in, the, in the class that had the knowledge, the teacher, they knew, and everybody else just listened, and they received the knowledge. And that seemed fine, and when I was to school, I thought that was fine, and maybe it was the case for you as well. But from the research uh, in the cognitive sciences in the last 50 years, we know that people don't learn like that anymore. What, they, what we do, what we humans being do, uh, is uh, we take the information from the outside world and then see whether it makes sense or not to us. And if it makes sense, we try to adapt it to what we learn. In other words, we try to control what we learn. It's not like we just sit there and we listen to the lecturer that has the truth from the gods and we, and we absorb it. Uh, and that paradigm, we, some people like our group are trying to change it with technology. So what we try to do is giving a bit more freedom to students so that the material is there, but they look through the material at their own terms. Sometimes the, this material includes activities, sometimes it includes games. Uh, so they play with the games and through this playing with the game, through this interaction, they make mistakes, they realize that they made mistakes. Something that we have discovered in the last 50 years is that we learn more from mistakes than from successes. So we let them make mistakes and then we are there to support them. Which is, you may say, well, this is what teachers have been doing their whole lives, the good teachers. They were not just talking, they were listening to students and interacting with them. And that's true. But the problem is that it's more difficult, and that's why there's a minority of teachers that do that. And that's why computers have never done that up to very, rec very recently. And this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to give a bit more control to students, a bit more freedom to students, and at the same time, analyzing what they are doing in the background with some artificial intelligence, with some algorithms, and then understanding what they want to learn, what they are trying to learn, what are the things that they are struggling with, so we can support them. So I think, well, it's not only that, there's more than that, but if I had to just yeah, select two, two strands of work in artificial intelligence in education, today, 2014, I would say the work on collaborative learning and the work on supporting exploratory learning and learning with games. And of course, both are related, but still they're distinct, I would say. Formerly, I work in the Department of Computer Science and in, in the Department of Computer Science in the group of Computational Intelligence. And inside the group of Computational Intelligence, which is roughly half of the department, 
uh, I have a small group which are my researchers, my postdoc researchers, my PhD students, uh, and we work mostly on this, on reasoning and games. We call ourselves the group, on, the lab on advanced learning technologies, games and reasoning. Uh, and that's at the, at the formal level. At the informal level, I also collaborate with the Center for Educational Neuroscience, which is a loose federation, well, federation is not the right word, it's a loose uh, grouping of uh, different researchers that are interested in cognition and, and psychology and learning and the computational aspects of the mind. Um, and I have also been very active for uh, several years at the London Noise Lab, which is a, it was a joint venture between the, uh, the Institute of Education and the learning scientists at the Institute of Education and the computer scientists here at Birbeck. And we were trying to, to look into the future of learning with digital technologies. And they were bringing their expertise on learning and psychology and cognitive sciences. We were bringing our uh, expertise on computation and, and artificial intelligence. And we have been working very closely together for, for several years now. And well, we, we have done a, maybe not, I wouldn't say myself, but definitely my colleagues have done a wonderful job all these years. Well, uh, I have several projects, both formal and informal, running at, at the time, at the moment. Uh, like for example, this project I was talking to you about, about creating tools for helping lecturers knowing what is going on in the classroom. That is uh, some work that I'm doing with one of my PhD students at the moment. But uh, probably the main project in which I'm involved now is, uh, is a project that was funded by, I got funding from the European Union, uh, quite a big grant, and it's a collaborative project uh, with four universities and three in, uh, companies in as many countries. And, and the project is called I Talk to Learn. Um, and the project is about, like most of my research, helping students learn, but the twist here is very interesting. The, the thing is, and this is something that uh, for some people is more difficult to understand, like Germans and Spanish people, because for us it's very easy to write once you know how to speak, because what you say and what you write is very similar, but in English it's quite the opposite. What you write and what you say are quite different, and actually children learn to read and write much later than they learn to speak. Um, and you may say that this is not such a big problem, but actually it is a problem because most of what we have been doing in technology for learning in the last 30 years was text-based and that's because the technology was limited at the time. So you were, you were given some application or some game or something to learn and most of the interaction was you read the question, you write the answer. Which is fine if you're happy reading and writing, if you're an adult learner or if you, your language allows you to easily write what you want to say. But when writing is difficult, because, because it's difficult in English, there's a big gap between what you say and what you write, then you have two problems as a kid. You have first to learn whatever you want to learn, let's say uh, working with fractions, mathematics at the, when you're seven, you're eight. So that's difficult. And on top of that, you have the difficulty of understanding the text, which is not trivial, and then writing an answer, which is not trivial either. So what this project is doing, this I Talk to Learn project, is we are using the latest advances in artificial intelligence, in machine learning and in speech recognition, to allow students to speak to the computer. Not only the computer speaks to them, which is something that we have, in, we have become used to that for in the latest years, but we are allowing students to speak to the computer in the same way that they speak to the teacher in the classroom. Because in the classroom, if you are not able to read what the computer says or what the book says, or it's, you kind of understand it but it's not clear, you can always raise your hand, talk to the teacher, and the teacher will understand what you say and will explain to you what you want to learn. But if you want to do that with a computer, up to now, that wasn't possible. And we are trying to get there. It's a three-year project. We are still midway through. We still have a lot of work to do. But we are making progress. And we, we are half made already some pilot studies in which kids were there working with the computer and they were speaking and the computer is understanding part of what they say and then based on understanding what they say and inferring from that what they are trying to do you can support what they do of and we have found very several challenges for example most of the, uh, we have found that kids which is something kind of evident in retrospect, but at the beginning some things that are, are evident later are not evident. We have found that kids speak in a very different way from what adults speak. And they are not as organized and they are not as, uh, they don't verbalize as much. So it's more difficult to understand what they are thinking from what they are saying. Which, well, if you are a human, if you are a teacher in the classroom, you don't realize it's something that you naturally do. Maybe the first year is difficult, but then you gradually get the hang of it. But when you try to make this explicit and simple in a way that the computer can understand, well, then it is a challenge. 
it is, it is really difficult and we are facing several difficulties in the project but well in the end that's what we why we do research right we try to get challenges and crack them open so well to help people li live better lives in a way most of my teaching 90 percent of my teaching is a module called programming in java in the machine computer science and this module is the, where we teach the basics of programming to students that do not have any computing background. The Machine and Computer Science is a master for people that do not have a background in computing but want to move into computing. So most of the people that most of the students we have are students that uh, they have some other career and because they don't have a strong career prospects or because they have realized that well, I have been doing this for 10 years but I don't like to do it anymore. They want to change careers and some of them want to move into computing which is evident because computing is wonderful. It's awesome. What can I say? So the, we have this master, the master in computer science, where we uh, teach them the basics of computing in one year or two years part time. So basically, we take a bachelor in computing and we compress it into one year, and we teach, we, we transform all these people into computer scientists. Some of them do not want to change careers; they do it because they want to complement what they are doing. For example, we have policemen and we have uh, attorneys that want to learn about computing because they want to fight uh, computing crime. Uh, we have psychologists, psychology researchers that want to learn more about computing because you can see the mind, the human mind as a computer as well, not like you have electronic computers and you have the human mind as a computer. And they want to learn more about electronic computers so that they, that helps them in their research. And we have other cases, but most of the people is because they want to change careers. They have been doing something else and now they want to move into computing. And programming in Java, which is the module I teach and where I am the coordinator, is where we teach them the basics of programming. We take them from zero and by the end of the third month, which is for the, uh, by the end of the term, which is two months if you are doing half term, we, well, they have become to a level where they are decent programmers. Okay, we make them work very hard, but they respond. The students that come to this master work very hard, uh, and they like to be pushed, and that's what we do. We push them to to become to have a decent level of programming in, in just three months. And then there's another module where we put them at the level that they can go to the industry and, and earn their living as, as computer programmers. So this is the, the main module that I teach. I also teach a bit in other modules, like the research methods in learning technologies, uh, where I teach a couple of um, a couple of sessions. And there's a, another module on statistical programming with R, but most of the teaching I do is this programming in Java module. Well, actually, the, there are two, two answers to that. First of all, uh, in this module called Research Methods in Learning Technologies, what I teach is basically my latest research. It's a, it's a module in the Master in Learning Technologies, which is an advanced module. And I have one or two sessions there every year where I basically teach the latest research findings I have done during the last year. So you could say that in that sense, my research influences my teaching because it's basically what I'm teaching in that module. In programming in Java, because programming in Java is a, a basic module, we are teaching the basic skills of programming. Not so basic, we teach them a lot, but we start at the very beginning. Um, there's not much space to teach any advanced topics that comes afterwards in the second term or the second year if you're doing it part time. So nothing of what I teach there is part is a result of my research. However, even if what I teach is not a result of my research, the way I teach it is influenced by my research because, uh, well, as I, as I had told before, I, I do research on how to use technology to help uh, learning and to help teaching. So I, I use my own tools, the tools we develop with my PhD students and my postdoctoral researchers. I use them in the, in the class to help me, for example, become aware whether they are learning or not, uh, whether they are all making progress or some of them are stuck. Um, I also, uh, use part of the technology that we develop at my group to uh, analyze what they, and this is a work in progress at the moment, to analyze what they are doing, to help to provide them some support when they become stuck at the, at the moment. Most of the work is done by me and my teaching assistants, and we are there, and if they have a problem, we are there, we help them, we listen to them. But we are trying to use technology as much as possible to support them. That means that they will get quicker support. I mean, if, if there are five people at the same time with a problem in the classroom, I can only talk to one of them. But if the computer is able, and it's not easy, but we are getting there. If the computer is able to talk to you and or analyze what you are doing in your computer lab, in, in this particular case, in teaching programming, and understand what's the problem, and then 
give you a link to additional material or maybe provide an additional explanation or show a video either from me or from somebody else that explains the concept well maybe you don't need to talk to the lecturer anymore maybe you're just that video just that additional material that's that or maybe just that additional comment or that additional suggestion makes you click and then oh now i see the problem because this is something that happens to me very often in the lab i come to talk to the student and the student says well i have been trying this for half an hour and i cannot get there and then you look at what they are doing you talk to them and then you say well why don't you change just this line and then they do of course which is well some, it happens to you it happens to me it happens to everyone when, when we are learning i'm trying to get there by using technology and of course the applications are many uh, now massive open uh, online courses are becoming very popular and people are becoming uh, used to to learn more and more online all of these hopefully will make that a reality and hopefully in a way that is useful and better for everybody so that's a dream and that's what I'm aiming at.